Hi, Chris. Yeah. Thanks so much to you, and thanks to uh, all of you who are watching and joining us um, uh, from wherever you may be uh, today. Uh, I can only hope that the quality of this conversation uh, will stand up to the uh, uh, the high standards that uh, were put forward in the various uh, discussions we had this hour yesterday. So thank you. Um, I do want to just uh, mention and get one thing out of the way as we start here. Um, this whole uh, discussion and this whole symposium on talent and diversity, as many of you know, uh, was put together some time ago. It was put together before the murder of George Floyd. It was put together uh, when this particular conversation about racism and standing against it uh, was focused largely on racism against people of Asian ancestry in this country, uh, the kind of racism that spiked uh, as, a, as another bad consequence of the coronavirus pandemic. Here, of course, and at this moment, things have changed dramatically. The conversation changes uh, necessarily, and uh, we have uh, a truly diverse group, diverse in many different ways, uh, to come at this issue. Um, diverse in terms of geography, profession, as you just heard Chris outline. Uh, and so uh, we will dive in here, and wherever the conversation takes us, we'll be sure to leave some time uh, for any questions those of you watching may have. Uh, and with that, I'm going to dive in and I'm going to pick on Shireen Dodson to start. Uh, just okay. a little more uh, of the uh, uh, background that, that Chris put out uh, for our audience. Uh, ombudsman at the United Nations now, yes, uh, but also held that role for a, a decade or so at the State Department. So basically you have, uh, Shireen, uh, worked at two of... Uh, uh, probably the largest and most influential global organizations of, of their kind or institutions. And of course, as ombudsman, and by the way, Shireen corrected me, I was going to say ombudsperson, but apparently that's not a term. So ombudsman she is. Uh, but certainly you know a thing or two about institutional responses to all sorts uh, of moments and crises. And of course, this one is not like other moments necessarily. But I wonder just as a general way to frame our conversation now, uh, what, in your experience, uh, at either of those institutions or others, is the most important thing or one or two most important things uh, that an institution needs to get right, uh, that its leadership uh, need to focus on uh, at the outset? Well, thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, I think first and foremost, they must respond, and they must respond timely, and that response must be authentic and spoken from the heart. Secondly, they need to educate themselves on the issue. And thirdly, they must take meaningful action. Words are not enough. They actually have to walk the talk. Yeah, so those are terms authentic, especially, and walking the talk that uh, frankly, didn't just come up in the conversations we had yesterday, but uh, have come up internally at the Asia Society, and we don't need to uh, get into those. But um, uh, perhaps you can then take us uh, on a little bit of a deeper dive at the organization you're now with. And one could say, uh, one could assume from the outside, certainly, that while well, the United Nations, there's no more diverse organization just by its very nature uh, anywhere on the planet, right, uh, and truly global. Uh, and yet, uh, as you pointed out, uh, the, the Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, has acknowledged in the wake of, uh, of George Floyd's murder and all the trauma that it has unleashed in this country and around the world, uh, that there is racism within the United Nations, that it has to be grappled with, and, uh, and, and that concrete action is needed. So I wonder if you can speak a bit to... Um, uh, to that concrete action. I think you made the point to me that the United Nations is not uh, typically, uh, was your phrase, sort of self-introspective. But talk a bit about what's been going on uh, uh, at the UN at the moment. You know, I will applaud the Secretary General for immediately issuing a very strong statement condemning racism around the world. Um, he then went further to internally hold a town hall where he acknowledged racism within the organization, but went further because he actually convened a working group to develop not just one program, but a year-long program to address any internal racism. 
happy to say I'm sitting on that working group. We've had one joint meeting with HR. I'm writing as we speak a, a plan to present to the Secretary General that is very comprehensive, multidimensional. It, it involves data collection, um, education, um, having conversations at all different levels, and then doing in the end some final assessments of where are we? What recommendations can we uh, move up the chain that will affect policy? So he is not a man who's just checked the box. He is authentic, he walks the talk, and he is charging us to take some action. I think the UN, because of the nature of the work and the position we hold in the world, it's hard sometimes to look introspectively. You're so busy trying to talk about humanity in, in the rest of the world. But I think this is an opportunity that all organizations are doing just that, looking introspectively and in how they can walk the talk, and we are no exception. And when you say that about the United Nations, just so our viewers understand, are you speaking about uh, you know, headquarters here in New York, or is the mandate of this kind of work that you're talking about now extend globally? Because of course, racism, while we're paying, I guess, the bulk of the attention to it at the moment, um, in the uh, cities and communities across this country, it's a global phenomenon, obviously. So is it, is it, is, is your approach? The, the approach is globally. The UN is a global organization made up of many different races, many different issues, but this is a global approach that he has requested. And not only in the UN secretary, but other agencies that make up the UN family. Right. And I don't, I hope I'm not, you know, uh, either putting you on the spot or, or, and it's maybe it's just a, a, a draft idea, but uh, I, you had mentioned that uh, there might be a program of, of readings. And I was interested in that because that is something that, uh, again, one might say that's, that's, you know, that's a personal choice. People read what they want to read, but, but is that uh, going forward? And if so, can you talk a little bit about it? Well, it, it's a, it's it's going to be part of the plan that I put forward. You know, there have been lots of um, reading programs where a city has read an entire book. You know, one book, one UN, if you want. So I think there are several books here that about racism um, that don't necessarily they're just foundational. And I think before people come to this conversation which people come with different things. Some people are new to the conversation. They have watched the horrific murders on TV. They've watched uh, the news report. They're, they don't know or having trouble how to internalize the feeling. Others are coming with frustration, maybe a little anger or some sadness that it's taken yet another murder of a black man to get action. So I think the idea of reading a book that talks about some of these issues so that people have a level, level playing field from which to start the conversation. Um, you just can't come into the conversation, I believe, without some education and some knowledge. So it's not uh, promulgating any one perspective. It's just trying to get people comfortable with talking about the issue. Okay, and one before we leave the UN, any any titles uh, in that mix already? Because we could all use, uh, I speak for myself anyway. Um, well, uh, let me just, sure. yeah, what I, um, from my own office, um, we deal with people who find themselves in a workplace conflict. And as practitioners, I felt, again, extremely important that we had to have a certain comfort level. So with my team, we're reading So You Want to Talk About Race um, by Njuma Ulu. And I think it's a great foundational book. We have had two book club discussions and we'll have another one. And it has really been very helpful and enlightening for my own team. And my team, I have offices around the world. So they are addressing our staff around the world. And they have two of one said that this has been a helpful which is another reason I got the idea 
to take it more global. Well, thank you, uh, Shireen Dodson. It's a great perspective and some interesting ideas. We'd love actually to, to check in again, maybe uh, in a few months time to see uh, which of your draft plans uh, has taken hold. Um, uh, let's move Absolutely. over to, uh, if we can, to uh, Zeng Wang. Uh, Zeng Wang, by the way, likes to, to go by Z, so uh, uh, don't be shocked. I'm not being crazy informal here when I call you that. Uh, Z is an investor. He's also an alumnus, uh, we are proud to say, of our Asia 21 uh, Young Leaders uh, Network at the Asia Society. And recently, I mean really recently, just three months ago, uh, named the head of the Committee of 100, which for those who don't know, I assume most of our audience does, uh, works to further uh, both better U.S.-China relations and advocates on behalf of uh, the Chinese community in this country. And uh, fair to say, Z, that uh, uh, even three months ago, uh, you had a fair bit on your plate uh, as the new head of the C-100. Uh, and uh, as I said at the outset, in terms of what we were originally planning to talk about today, uh, very active along with a lot of organizations in standing up against um, uh, both racist acts that had been committed against uh, not only the Chinese, but I guess in particular the Chinese community in the wake of the COVID outbreak and also some of the rhetoric, the uh, China flu uh, and so forth that was coming from high places. Um, and then uh, the Committee of 100, um, under your leadership now, uh, after the murder of, of George Floyd, um, pivoted to something that I think you've said is, is the first for the organization, expressing not only solidarity with the black community, uh, outrage at the murder, and then there was this quote, uh, we join with the black community uh, to build a better country. And I am curious, uh, Z, if you can share with us a little bit about, first of all, just what you meant uh, by that, and what concrete actions uh, did you or, or do you uh, have in mind? Thank you, Tom. Uh, very much appreciate it. Uh, as you well articulated, you know, during COVID-19, we saw a significant increase in anti-Chinese, anti-Asian uh, incidents uh, resulting in violence and in cases, um, you know, severe violence against Chinese Americans and Asian Americans. And during that time, many other communities, including Jewish Americans, African American, organizations reached out to us because they understood that this wasn't a Chinese problem. It wasn't an Asian problem. It was an American problem. And we must unite together to address this American problem for all of us. And so when the, uh, the tragedy of George Floyd happened, we realized that it was time for us to act as well because this was an American problem. And, and to your words, words are important because at times, you have to take a stand, but you must do more than words. And we believe that we must do more. So we got together as an organization during COVID-19 to really pull together our resources and to contribute and help lead the efforts. We, through our members, uh, have donated about $11 million in, in money, funds, PPEs. So far, we've donated PPEs to 36 healthcare organizations and hospitals around the US. And today we have about $3 million worth of PPE that we are working with various African-American and Latino organizations to donate to those communities. Because we all know that the second surge is very likely and our minority communities are disproportionately affected. I'm sure Dr. Sager could speak more to that. And, and we believe that today is a, opportunity for us to concretely do something. And so we're working with, for example, the Urban League. I know Mark is speaking later on uh, to help distribute these PPE. And we're working with many other organizations in the community because we believe that today, these communities could be served by some of these needed PPEs. Beyond that, we also believe that this is a time to really discuss and understand. And so we are, not launching a speaker series focused on social justice. So Professor Maya Wiley is speaking tomorrow and we have several in the planning because we believe that this is one of those rare opportunities where we could come together and truly understand and truly understand not just what Africans are facing, understand what we can concretely do 
to help solve this common American problem. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for that, Z. I, I appreciate it. And just, I, I think by now everybody knows what PPP, PPE is, but personal protective equipment, uh, so much part of, of the lexicon now. And when Z was referring to Mark, that's Mark Morial, head of the National Urban League, who will, uh, oh, in about, I think, an hour's time or so, be speaking with uh, Josette Sheeran, president and CEO of the Asia Society. Uh, you said also to me, Z, uh, in terms of, of the response that I think there was an acknowledgement that, um, as you put it, that, that the Chinese community, uh, and I don't know whether you meant in America necessarily or in China or wherever, uh, but you, um, uh, you felt that the Chinese community has a fair bit to learn and that there is misunderstanding about the black experience in America. And we certainly have seen uh, in this country and in China uh, uh, racist acts and behavior uh, on occasion uh, against, um, against blacks and black Americans here. How, how to combat that misunderstanding from, uh, is that part of what you have in mind with the social justice series or are there other things uh, 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 to address that side of the American problem? Yes, well, first of all, we are an American organization and so we represent, to, you, to what you described earlier, the interests of Chinese Americans in America. And of course, we also believe that we have a role to play to help further the relationship or productive relationship between US and China. So, you know, many of, of, of Chinese Americans, and I believe Asian Americans believe in the American dream, believe that if we work hard, if we study hard, if we give our best, we can all reach the American dream. And I think that's worked well for many of us. But I think it's also important to remember that today, you know, as a Chinese American and Asian American, we're able to marry the person we want to marry from a different race, you know, to buy a home we want to buy in the neighborhood we want, to take the job that we want to take anywhere in the country, and to sit anywhere we want in a bus or in a restaurant, largely thanks to the pioneering work of African Americans. And we are very much indebted. And so today, when African-Americans are discussing and trying to address systematic biases in this country, I think they're doing it on behalf of all Americans, right, regardless of race. And so it's important today for us to come together to understand, you know, some of the root causes, both social, economic, and more importantly, what we could do together to address these things. Because I think today there's a unique opportunity where all eyes are on this. And I think there's a unique opportunity to potentially do systematic changes. You know, I got to admit, I came to the States when I was 10 from China. I grew up in Los Angeles. And I remember growing up, uh, you know, the, I went to Beverly Hills. And it was beautiful. There. Big houses, gorgeous people, these fancy shops. And then I drive a little bit and I go to Compton. And it as if it's a different world. Right. And, and you know what? As a young boy, I couldn't understand. But by and large, I filed it away. As if this was supposed to be. It was just life. But I think today we have a unique opportunity to say, you know what? This isn't what it's supposed to be. Right. This isn't the America that we all, all want to live in. And we have it today. And today we have an opportunity to create the America we all want. And so I think we, we at C100, along with many organizations like Asia Society and others, to really come together to see if we can do our small part to create that better America. Thank you for that. And I'm just making a note because it's a really, it's a new phrase for me anyway, you know, don't just file it away, right? Because uh, that, that's another way of saying what Shereen Dodson said about you got to walk the talk. Well, thank you. And uh, uh, Dr. Sugger, I, I apologize for coming to you last that there is no uh, uh, judgment there. And I also want to, uh, Again, a reminder for those just joining who missed the introduction, Dr. Siraj Sugar is Chief of Infectious Disease at Holy Name Hospital Center. And before we say anything, uh, I want on behalf of, of all of us uh, uh, here in the New York metropolitan area, uh, uh, Dr. Sugar's hospital is in New Jersey, but uh, uh, just to say thanks, because uh, uh, I know from what even uh, I've read briefly about what your hospital went through, um, uh, you know, war zone is not, uh, those are not terms we take lightly, but uh, I know it was really rough. So our thanks to you uh, and all your colleagues uh, for everything uh, 
uh, you did in those times and, and grateful to learn in our conversation earlier that, that things have come calm down, but welcome and thank you. Thank you so much for having um, me, Tom, and I'm very honored and humbled uh, to be part of such a talented and inspiring panel. Yeah, well, I wasn't going to go there at the start, but but Z's last comments put me put this in mind. He was talking about coming here at age 10 and and what he saw. I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing uh, with our audience what you shared with me about uh, your experience as a young uh, uh, Indian American in uh, in Southern Maryland. Uh, if, if, just just what happened to you uh, when you and your family moved into that that nice new home? Uh, there because it's relevant to this conversation. Sure, so you know, um, unfortunately racism affects us all um, as minorities in, in different ways. And um, the story that I shared with you uh, is that when my parents came here searching for the American dream, uh, they were very fortunate uh, to have been educated in their country as physicians and um, you know, eventually came here, worked hard and were able to save money and, and, and move to a nice neighborhood. Um, and what I relayed to you in which I, I keep dear to my heart only because it inspires me to always do better um, and to try to overcome adversity is the KKK had um, had planted about 50 or 60 for sale signs in our yard. And um, so when we opened the door, you know, you saw not a burning cross, but you saw a 50 for sale signs, you know, basically saying get out of, of this neighborhood. Um, and that's something that obviously burns uh, within oneself uh, very deeply. And years later, as a physician, you know, I try to take that, that task and say, you know what, what can I do not just to treat people medically, um, but also understand there's a lot a physician can do to impact uh, people's lives outside of medicine. And certainly, the, you know, it's become a mantra now that racism is a public health issue. But I tell you, it's, it's very much true and real and very much evidence as by what the experiences we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic, of which, unfortunately, my own medical institution was essentially the epicenter in northern New Jersey. Yeah. So, first of all, thank you for sharing uh, uh, that, that difficult experience um, from your youth. And um, I know you've experienced other forms of racism in your professional life, but most recently you have been uh, really outspoken uh, um, about the disparities in outcomes and in healthcare generally uh, that COVID has uh, has laid bare for those who weren't paying enough attention or filing that away uh, more recently, which is uh, particularly profound in the Black and Latinx communities. And we've all read about that. Um, so I think we're familiar, uh, at least at the moment, with, uh, with the gravity of the issue. But I wonder, and this is a big question, I realize, but uh, from your standpoint as a leading medical uh, professional, um, what are some of the ways, uh, the, the best ways that you think we can at least begin to tackle um, uh, that disparity? Is it a problem of healthcare policy? Is it a problem for hospitals and institutions like yours to, uh, to get at? Is it just a matter of the fundamental income disparity we see? What, what, what's, uh, uh, what are some of the root issues, do you think, and, and how best to go after them? You know, I think it's really a multifaceted issue. Uh, certainly, it's socioeconomic. Uh, you know, it's very easy uh, during a pandemic to tell people stay at home. You have a white collar job, you have Wi-Fi, you can work from home, you can do Zoom meetings, etc. What about the lower socioeconomic uh, person who's renting a house with four other people? They can't quarantine. They have a common kitchen. They have a common family room. Uh, they can't take a private car. They have to take ways the buses. They can't stay at home. They don't stay at home. They don't uh, uh, put food on the table. They can't pay the rent. And so they have to take that job in the kitchen, uh, in construction, and put themselves at risk. You know, what I tell people is that this virus, uh, COVID-19, knows no caste, the creed, or religion. It, it, it brought, uh, you know, destruction and despair across the board. But I would be remiss, and, you know, this is not just me. This is all my healthcare professional and colleagues. We saw that the, it was glaringly obvious to us that we saw certain socioeconomic and racial disparities that were really essentially too much to bear. Um, the, the pandemic started very quickly within lowers or, or my, different minority populations. It spread across the board uh, to affect every religion, every ethnicity. But then when those, most people got the wind that we should stay at home, we were wondering why is it we're still seeing certain minorities still being affected so badly? And that's when we actually took a pause and said, you know, there's certain issues here. It's not because they are not educated 
or they're lazy or they are not caring about their health. It's because for them to survive, they cannot do what we're asking. They cannot self-quarantine at home. They may be working three different jobs and can't take time to go see the doctor and treat their diabetes, which we know uh, put people at extra risk for developing bad complications uh, from COVID-19. So it was really, you know, as been mentioned already uh, by Zee and Shireen, you, you have to look introspectively. And we said, you know, one, there's outside issues, these socioeconomic issues, but are there issues as physicians that we may be responsible for? There's a lot of talk about cultural competency um, when treating patients, you know, end of life care. Different religions have different uh, ways of approaching it. We need to be more uh, competent, co culturally competent and aware of how people uh, 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 interpret and perceive of different uh, difficult health care issues. Uh, but we also realize, you know, do we have our own internal bias? Why is it if you have an African-American and you have a Caucasian and they're seeing the physician the same amount of times, their blood pressure or their diabetes are oftentimes not as well controlled with the African-American versus the Caucasian? Do we make our own uh, subconscious uh, assumptions that well, you know, we may, this person may not listen, so we may not treat them as aggressively as we would someone else. And so I think this was really a moment of reflection where we all you know, want to treat our, our job is to treat patients as best as we can, but we have to go beyond just the medical issues and, and look into the cultural differences and also address perhaps are there our own uh, um, issues that we may need to address so that we can truly uh, uh, treat patients as one and not and not uh, have certain assumptions and let certain ethnicities and socioeconomic uh, minorities uh, get left behind. Because I, as I said, I mean, the idea of racism as a public health issue, it really should be in the forefront here. And the COVID-19 pandemic has brought that to light. Uh, so I'm very, I won't say thankful, but I'm glad that we're having this conversation. I think we have to continue to have this conversation. You know, physicians in general may complain that they're overburdened. They have to deal with um, different ethnicities and, and translators. And there's a lot of uh, bureaucracy, insurance company issues on their plate. But I can tell you every physician I've talked to, all my colleagues who are all extremely talented, and I'm very thankful to work with them, you know, really take this issue to heart. And they, they were very much disturbed that they were seeing over and over again. Now, in our own institution in Bergen County in northern New Jersey, it was predominantly the Hispanic population that was Unfit, un, unfortunately having to share the burden. We know in other parts of the country it was the African-American population in, in, in uh, Detroit, Chicago, Milwaukee. But the overriding, and if we actually look around the world, it was oftentimes a disease of migrants. If I look at my ancestral home, India, you know, I have relatives there that are well to do. They can stay at home, they can self-quarantine, but it's the migrants coming from other countries or the lower socioeconomic rung uh, uh, patients that are most afflicted. So this is again, a global issue that we see and we truly really have to address their professions. So um, again, I, I recognize it's a big question and, uh, uh, and you've, you've answered it in many ways. I just want to tease out briefly, if you could, Dr. Sugar, a, a, another point that you made to me. So, so Dr. Sugar, uh, if you don't know, hosts a podcast called Recommended Daily Dose uh, with uh, an African-American physician uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Clinton uh, Coleman. And one thing you said, uh, you made a point that when it comes to diversity in the medical profession, in the United States anyway, South Asians are well represented. East Asians, yes. pretty well represented. Black Americans, not so much. And I think you said basically uh, you could use more Dr. Coleman's. What, um, uh, I guess that's not necessarily the job of the, well, maybe it is the job of the chief of infectious, infectious diseases at a hospital, but um, how, how do we at least begin to tackle that problem? And I, it's a big one, but if you can keep that brief. No, it is a big issue, but it's a very important one to discuss. Um, you know, I think they've done numerous studies showing that, especially African-American men may take uh, advice from a African-American physician more to heart than, let's say, a Caucasian or an Indian-American physician. And so Dr. Coleman, who is a very talented nephrologist, a very good friend of mine and my co-host of my podcast, you know, we've discussed often that we need more minorities, underrepresented minorities, so Native American, Hispanic, African American. Why? Not just because we're trying to fill some kind of quota, because I believe, and I, it's, I think it's been proven, that they may be able to provide better care for certain different ethnicities. And that has been a subject that has been discussed by the American Medical Association, the American College of uh, uh, the, 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 other, the, the subsequent uh, organizations that deal with uh, American Association of Medical Colleges, looking to increase treatment. And I can tell you from, uh, you know, physicians and, and, and minority colleagues of mine, uh, they do things like sponsoring uh, 
helping mentorships for uh, pre-meds and medical uh, and pre-medical uh, students to in- encourage them to come into medicine. You know, my parents came here as physicians, so I had that exposure growing up. A lot of very talented, highly educated, very smart and driven uh, uh, individuals may not have, they may be first time uh, uh, members of the family going to college, et cetera. They may not have those role models, so to speak, uh, to inspire them to go into medicine. So I think it's very important to keep that in mind, to have mentorship programs, et cetera, to, right. to move the needle, uh, uh, to have further uh, a diversity within medicine. Thank you, Dr. Tugger. And we have some questions coming in from the audience, um, actually uh, several now. Here's one for, for you, Shireen. And in a way, I think you answered this, but if you want to say another word about it, uh, for Shireen Dotson, we see protests regarding racism outside the United States. What are your thoughts about having a global review uh, as racism is not limited to the U.S.? Well, the, the initiative that we are working on is global. And it will take into consideration all of the UN, which is quite global. So yeah. I think you know and, I am um, you know very impressed with the support that the United States is getting from other countries. But as the Secretary General has says, it is a global issue. Racism is true in every country in the world, and we need to do what we can to eradicate it. Yeah. Um, I do want to come back, Shireen, because both of your your fellow panelists here happened uh, uh, to mention uh, experiences from from several decades ago. Uh, I I happened just in preparation for this to come upon a Washington Post article exactly years ago when a very young Shireen Dodson and her husband were uh, uh, interviewed uh, uh, living in Washington at the time. And I... uh, Clearly talking about some of the same things we're talking about now. And you told the reporter then uh, that when you spoke to your young children about race, you said, quote, life is not fair. Don't expect it to be fair. Uh, so w- w- would you say the same thing now to a young child? Um, Ab- absolutely. Um I think that as a parent, we we have no choice but to prepare our children for the harsh realities of the world. I used to also say racism is alive and well in America. And I didn't do that to create a chip on their shoulder or to make them look for racism every time they were denied something or didn't get what they want. It was more to make them understand that there was systemic racism in America and the le- the playing field wasn't level. And if they were gonna succeed and get ahead, they had to work harder, they had to be better just to compete. And I think those were valuable lessons. I think I would tell any parent to do that. As an African-American parent, you had to tell your child things to do so hopefully they wouldn't end up like Floyd. I I do remember my son was going to Germany um, after um, 9-11 to visit a friend. He's 6'3". I said, they're going to pull you out of line. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. And all I need you to say is, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he had a wonderful trip and came back and said, mom, they did everything you told me they were going to do to me. And if I hadn't been prepared, I would have lost my temper and may have been locked up. You know, so yes, we need to prepare our children for the realities of the world. And those realities still exist. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks for that answer, although I'm sad to hear it, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's well said and, and it speaks to all the things we're talking about here. There are other questions in chat. I do think most of them have been answered already. I wonder if in the, in the time that remains, I mean, Given what you just said, Shireen, given what you mm-hmm. said, Dr. Sugar, about the, the health care issues, given Z, and we haven't even gotten to this, but, you know, um, the fact that uh, uh, the president of the United States still as recently as, as uh, five days ago, not only called it the Chinese virus, but he called it, he, he referred to, you know, I'm not even going to repeat the phrase he used uh, uh, to describe uh, uh COVID at, at the rally in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma the other day. I don't think it bears repeating. 
these are such profound issues, each in their own way. And so I'd like to just turn this around and ask each of you for a brief thought. Uh, I actually hope you have more than brief thoughts to say what in this moment, as you look at the moment or the way forward different perspectives, what gives you hope? Dr. Sugar, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. You know, I'll start off with a quote from one of my own personal heroes, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. It's actually more of a paraphrase, but, you know, he had said uh, when he was uh, nonviolent um, uh, uh, civil un unrest uh, for India's independence against the British, he said, if you look at the side of history, even though struggles, uh, you know, are very long, oftentimes good, always good overcomes evil. So for me, I think this struggle has been very long. I mean, it's, it's going back to times of civil rights and, and, and Martin Luther King, who also, you know, by the way, and took inspiration from Mahatma Gandhi. And it continues to this day. But what's inspiring is that I do believe uh, truly that, that, you know, throughout all this, I think eventually good will overcome evil. Um, and, that, you know, if we look across the world, you look at people who are up, it's all of humanity. It's not just one ethnicity. And that gives me a lot of, um, of, of inspiration and hope that we can once, hopefully, I, I truly hope, you know, once and for all, stamp out this evil uh, of racism. Thank you. Z, you have some reasons to, for hope? Well, I, I do want to address the theme that was originally set up for this seminar, perhaps a couple of months ago. And everyone knows that with the election cycle rolling around, you know, China will be an important topic. And we believe that it is an important topic, relationship between U.S. and China. But we believe that it should be government to government and focus on the policy. And it should never devolve to a people, and definitely not to American citizens of Chinese descent or American citizens who just happen to look Chinese. I think this is the right thing to do because these are the civil liberties that generations of Americans have fought for. And we are continuing to fight for. But I think it's also the smart thing to do. Today, mm -hmm. one in every 10 nurses are Asian Americans. Two in every 10 doctors are Asian Americans. Up to 30% of the scientists in biotechnology and biomedicine researching for a vaccine are Asian Americans. I mean, this is the smart thing to do to protect our communities who are helping and contributing and leading the effort to come back from COVID-19. So I really believe that what we're doing just is the right, the smart thing. And more importantly, I think by doing this, we are all helping to create uh, America that we all want, right? Inclusive because of our uniqueness and not divided because of perceived otherness. And so this is something that C100 is dedicated to do. We know that the Asia Society as well, we know that there are so many amazing organizations, including the United Nations, and we really welcome those efforts to work together. Uh, once again, you know, in Chinese, the, the words for crisis has two characters. The first is crisis, the second is opportunity. And I think we really should take advantage of this unique opportunity to make us better, to make us into the America that we all want. Shireen Dotson, those are tough, tough acts to follow, but no doubt you can. Leave us with some reason to hope, can you? I, I am hopeful. I, I guess I, there is something different. And I, I don't know whether it will translate into systemic change, but what I, I get hope when I look into the faces of this younger generation their determination um and it has taken 400 years to build the system of systemic racism and i just you know i understand bureaucracies i understand politics and i i'm afraid of the reality where it says those in power when they feel threatened will do anything to hold on to that power but these young people are resilient they're determined, they're not gonna give up. And if we can translate that into voting, they understand they need to vote. They need to understand the power structures and the policies to be able to change it. 
So I'm hopeful that we're getting there. I'm looking at the results of some of the elections yesterday. People out of nowhere who are activists have won elections. They're going to go to Congress and they'll change policy. So to me, it's we're getting the educational word out and we just need to hold on. But I do think there's hope. This generation is not going to give up. They want something better. And so that's what gives me hope. And I will continue to work to make the conversation into reality. Well, thank you. And I'll answer my own question only briefly about reasons for hope. It's a small thing, but, uh, you know, uh, about a month and a half ago, when we were having a conversation on our global online platform at the Asia Society about racism against uh, Asian Americans, uh, the commentator Van Jones from CNN came to that platform and said, and I quote, uh, we stand with our Asian American brothers and sisters. Uh, we always have and we always will. And actually, he cited some of the same numbers and statistics and accomplishments you cited, Z, uh, of, of, of the Asian American community in this country. Congresswoman Grace Mung, who has also been with us at the Asia Society, Congresswoman in Queens, she said, uh, leaders in the black community have always been there with us every step of the way. Now we must stand there with them. It's a small thing. And the other thing that gives me hope are three people like yourself who are so committed uh, to the path forward. And uh, your words today have given me some hope. I hope it's the case for our audience as well. Dr. Cigar, Z, and Shireen Dodson uh, at the UN. Thank you so much.